Hello, and welcome to a new Starting Conversations series brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. Starting Conversations is a roundtable discussion series that explores history and culture in New Mexico and beyond. I'm Bethany Tabor, the host, and I'm very thrilled to be sharing this new series with the world, Culture Springs from Food. Uh, this series will explore the unique relationship between food and culture in New Mexico, bringing together voices, including farmers, chefs, local experts, artists, historians, and academics, among others. We are so lucky to be partnering with an organization based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Three Sisters Kitchen. Three Sisters is a nonprofit kitchen, cafe, and community space focused on nourishing communities through food, education, and public engagement. Our conversation today is moderated by Isha Aaron. Isha is the Food Storytelling Programs Manager at Three Sisters Kitchen, where she's working on Cooking for Generation, a project that cultivates new and emerging artists, celebrates the food traditions that define our communities, and builds a visual and audio archive of New Mexico food stories and practices. She is also an award-winning writer whose work focuses on entertainment, politics, and race. Isha, please take it away. Thanks, Bethany, and hello, everyone. On behalf of Three Sisters Kitchen, I'm so excited for our fourth and final installment of Culture Springs from Food. Um, today's topic is food futurisms. So if you've been following along with our program, our previous discussions have included Cooking as Archiving, which looked at the way that food can preserve and change culture, Food and Power, which explores the exploitations and solutions for workers across the food chain, and Borders and Diets, which dove into colonization's disruption of cultural food waves and its continued impact today. That of course brings us to today. And today we wanna to give you a culmination of sorts and dedicate some time to looking to the future of food, imagining um, what real sovereignty could look like and exploring the people and the movements working towards that. So I will start off by introducing our panel and for each panelist, I'll ask a quick question. So first we have Jovita Belgard, Youth Program Specialist and for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Jovita is from the Oke, Owinge, and Isleta Pueblos of New Mexico and the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Nation of North Dakota. She's passionate about working with Native youth and making positive social change in Native communities. She received her BA in Criminology from the University of New Mexico and received her Prevention Specialist Certification from the New Mexico Credentialing Board for Behavioral Health Professionals. She's worked in the prevention field for seven years prior to coming to NIWRC, working with Native youth doing violence prevention, suicide prevention, substance abuse prevention, and experiential education. While at the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, Jovita created an Indigenous seed library and garden giveaway events in tribal nations because she believes that food insecurity is violence, and food sovereignty is essential to creating strong, healthy communities. Jovita works from strength-based perspective, from a strength-based perspective that encourages growth, healing, and intentionality. Thank you so much for joining us, Jovita. And a quick question for you: How does food sovereignty work in tandem with gender justice? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start by introducing myself traditionally because that's that's uh, one of our cultural protocols um, when when talking to people. But um, I think that's a that's a a big question. <laughs> um, like in general, like when we're talking about food sovereignty and general justice, um, you know, tribal nations have been asserting. Uh, like sovereignty by creating laws and policies um, to increase quality of life for um, our people for many years and uh, creating opportunities for food sovereignty um, enable people to grow our own food. Um, like we believe that access to healthy food should be a human right because food sovereignty is violence prevention. So um, like in the prevention work that I do, uh, we often talk about things called perfect, protective factors and risk factors. Um, there are things that make you more or less at risk for danger like violence, substance abuse, suicide, and other things. And we often hear about risk factors, like if you grow up without healthy relationships, like being around trusted peers or trusted adults, you could be at risk for X, Y, Z. Um, well, the flip side of that 
is protective factors. So if you have an increased amount of protective factors in your life, you're more likely to be healthy. Um, and folks that experience violence are at risk or are at risk for violence are often folks that don't have power, like being non-male or a person of color, LGBTQ2S plus, disabled or being unsheltered. So basically anyone that's not, uh, you know, cis, hat, white, able-bodied male with wealth, um, those folks experience violence on a much higher scale than others. And if they're provided with access to supports, they're more likely to be healthy. Like one of the biggest protective factors is having your basic needs met. Um, so when thinking about this in terms of gender justice or violence that happens to, you know, non-male people of color and LGBTQ2S plus relatives, we wanna make sure that they have all the help they need to thrive. So when people have their basic needs met, they're, they're less likely, um, they're less at risk for violence and all those unhealthy dangers. Um, food sovereignty addresses the violence imposed by hunger and food insecurity. And like if women, people of color, um, LGBTQ2S plus relatives are food secure, they're more likely to thrive and be well. <laughs> and that's why it's important. And that's why we have to do everything we can to create food systems that support and uplift our people. So. Thank you so much. That was really, you said it was a big topic, but it was a really great, uh, that was a great answer. Um, to move on, next we have Michelle E. Carreon, the food justice story storyteller at La Semilla Food Center. La Semilla is a food justice organization based in Anthony, New Mexico, working to foster a healthy, self-reliant, fair, and sustainable food system in the Paseo del Norte region of Southern New Mexico and El Paso, Texas. As a member of La Semilla's storytelling department, Michelle works with other staff and local community members to increase connection to the Chihuahuan desert ecosystem, uplift local foodways, stories, and histories, and create narrative change about the border region. Storytelling has been a central part of Michelle's life for as long as she can remember. She holds a PhD in the interdisciplinary field of American studies and is particularly interested in visual storytelling. I'll pass it to you, Michelle, for a quick question. Um, what is the importance of storytelling in food justice? Uh, well, thanks again, by the way, just for um, bringing me into this conversation. And I, I want to follow and also say that I feel like that question is a really big question. <laughs> it could go in so many directions, but I feel maybe all of the questions are, are big questions. Um, but the first thing I'm thinking about or I've thought about and kind of been marinating on um, since I received these questions is, is kind of like multi dimensional and I'm, I'm thinking back to a conversation I had with with one of my colleagues colleagues yesterday um, who, who's a poet and I'm not a poet and she always has a better way of like metaphors and all of that <laughs> describing things and what she said to me was that you know when we have a wound the physical wound um, we have to look at it to truly understand it we can't ignore that wound we actually have to address it and take care of it and in a sense you know nurture and heal you know the skin or whatever kind of wound you have um, so I think about that in terms of storytelling, because storytelling is both reflective as well as, I think, transformative. Um, and that's something we really focus on at La Semilla is going beyond telling stories just for the sake of telling stories. At our organization, we've been creating culture since the very beginning, and storytelling is a part of our work, um, even if we don't always fully address it or, you know, name it in that way. And so I would say that storytelling is important in terms of addressing food justice because it's how we understand our circumstances, it's how we understand our histories, and it's how we share a lot, not just in terms of our lived experiences, but also how we pass down knowledge and wisdom and practices in a way to fully address um, the various systems we're working within and the various um, inequities that were or injustices that we're, we're addressing. And at the core, storytelling is how we relate to each other. You know, that's so, without trying to be romantic, I mean, that's just, I think it's a part of who we are as humans. And so I always see and come back to how our stories really matter and have power. And I think for many of us who come from um, underrepresented and underfunded communities, our stories and our histories have been erased intentionally and, and you know rendered invisible for generations. So 
I see storytelling as a point of connection for sharing, you know, with each other, passing down culture, and like I said before, wisdom and practice, but also storytelling as change in terms of sharing, but also relating and coalition building. You know, a lot of us live, you know, we work with, you know, organizations and communities all over the country. And I feel like storytelling is a way for us to share and make points of connections. And from that can grow um, a strengthening of, of coalition building that only can increase a movement. So, yeah, I mean, I think all of that is very connected um, to also addressing and challenging dominant narratives in history. So, um, where I'm based and in the Paso del Norte region, and particularly El Paso in southern New Mexico, there's a lot of misconceptions and very harmful um, dominant narratives about both the border and the desert. When we talk about farming in the desert, a lot of people assume that the desert is barren. Um, if we look at the perpetuation of the term food desert, it sheds a very negative light on, on my region and, and the ecosystem that I grew up in. That's just very incorrect. <laughs> the desert is vibrant and it's a very diverse ecosystem. So a lot of our work um, in storytelling, and I think the power of storytelling is also challenging um, that context and continuing to challenge and I don't want to say reshape, but resist this consistent erasure um, of our histories, our stories, our experiences that's ongoing and not new. You know, I think a lot about education and, and the work we do with regard to education on different levels at our organization. Um, and one of the big examples in you know recent years is this attack on critical race theory, which is also a perpetuation of a lot of people don't really understand what critical race theory is, but that's not a new thing. That's something I think we've been experiencing and um, resisting and addressing for, for generations. So I feel like I rambled and I feel like that maybe was all over the place, but I'm really getting at both, you know, within our communities, um, you know, in terms of coalition building and sharing and telling stories and the really inherently beautiful aspect of it, but also how storytelling is really a, um, a strategy and a vehicle for change and transformation within our food systems. Um, that, no, I think that you were not rambling at all. I, that made total sense. And I think it speaks to how big and varied a role storytelling can play as something to preserve, something to shape, and something the word you use, resist, I thought was really um, important. So thank you. Um, and finally, our third participant is uh, Rebecca Grashwis. Rebecca is the garden manager at Project Feed the Hood Gardens, which is a social justice community garden space growing food and medicines. Um, they're focused on food sovereignty, medicinal plants, and the importance of food justice. Rebecca is from Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's a mother, farmer, and has been practicing as a local Chicana herbalist and wild crafter for 10 plus years focusing on traditional medicinal practices and uh, community support. Welcome Rebecca and a question for you. How can teaching traditional food systems help improve community health? So first off, I would like to say thank you for having me on. And I feel so honored that I get to speak with these amazing people that are doing this amazing work. Um, food systems and food sovereignty are uh, intrinsically linked with mental, emotional, and spiritual health in communities, um, especially when you think about it in terms of like the way that we, one of the base ways that we've communicated with each other um, intergenerationally um, and interculturally is sharing of food and resources. So when we start to look at community health, and we start to look at it in, you know, the terms of how food is treated, especially in this, you know, modern, you know, colonized day and age, we have, uh, I think a good representation of that is diet culture, where a lot of our traditional foods and a lot of our heritage foods are considered, you know, uh, junk foods or cheaper than this Eurocentric idea of what is healthy. Um, and that, you know, not only takes our experiences out of the picture, but it also takes our, like I said, our interactions. Um, food for me from a very young age was this uh, very harsh 
kind of reality. You know, I didn't grow up in a space where I was encouraged to have traditional foods or I was encouraged to be um, really a part of my own culture. And when I got older and I started learning about, um, for instance, quelites, which are a really big part of our food system here in New Mexico, um, it was kind of like this resurgence for me of tying into my ancestors, tying into my culture, tying into what it means to be a part of this bigger picture. And when we're trying to rebuild community health, we have to think about it in terms of mental health, emotional health, spiritual health. And all of those things are intrinsically tied into our food system. Um, like I said, you know, food is innately supposed to be reciprocity. It's supposed to be reciprocity with the earth. It's supposed to be reciprocity with communities, with each other, and with our own sense of spirituality and identity. And so when we start building this framework and we start, you know, doing this work, which has been so beautifully prevalent, here in Albuquerque and in New Mexico, uh, we start to really see a rise in connection and a rise in um, spaces where people feel safe and they feel heard. And the I like to think of it as like the carrier for that, the the support structure for that is, you know, our food and our stories and you know and the work that we're doing as a community. Um, it's incredibly important that like the people on this panel and the people that are listening realize that um, we've been put in a place where food is you know an, it's like a unwanted necessity in a lot of modern society we have a very painful very um, damaged relationship with our food systems and until we start building you know, a ecologically sound and a spiritually sound and a diverse platform for our food systems, we're going to continue to have the same issues that we have been with soil health, with physical health, with mental health, you know, and I, I, I really think it's beautiful that, um, like I said, we have so many people that are really doing this work now, uh, because even 15 years ago here in Albuquerque, it wasn't a big you know, conversation. It wasn't something that we thought about. And all of a sudden, there's this resurgence of young people and, and elders coming out of the woodwork being like, no, we need this. We need the support. We need to be able to, to eat our foods. We need to have a relationship with our foods because they're tied into our story. They're tied into our identity. They're tied into our heritage. And what better way to uh, deal with mental health issues, emotional issues, um, physical issues than to be connected to our past, present, and future. So, yeah. wow! Thank you. I <laughs> um, in a previous thing we in a previous panel we had talked about sort of food as something that is some, can be a form of escapism or people don't really want to think about it. So when you're talking about the sort of unwanted necessity, it is something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily want to reflect on but it does hold so much power and for connection. And like you said, or to learn more about our past, present and future. So um, thank you for that. To get into some of these other questions, I thought we would start with sort of defining our terms a bit. Um, and to start us off, I think the big picture, what is food sovereignty? And also how does it play into the work that you're doing? So just gonna keep things moving with big questions. They're just gonna get bigger and bigger, I think. <laughs> so. Um, uh, do you want to start us off, Jovita? Sure. Sorry, my puppy is like playing really hard right by my computer. So I apologize for the noise. Um, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like food sovereignty, I, um, I like, I guess like the simplest way to put it, it's our right to nurture our communities um, through sustaining our indigenous food systems. Um, <clears throat> I think this includes like caring for our seed relatives, uh, learning our language and practicing our cultural teachings, planting, growing, and harvesting food. Um, this includes water rights and how we care for uh, Nano Chukuyo, like all the living beings on mother earth. Um, they're all connected and we need them to be healthy for our communities to thrive. So I don't know. 
that was a like a, a thorough way to answer your question. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> um, uh, Rebecca, would you like to jump back in? Sure. So for me, food sovereignty is really about creating sustainable practices, um, culturally sustainable practices, uh, physically sustainable practices, and uh, ecologically sustainable practices that allow for people to um, thrive and to create spaces where they feel safe and they feel heard and they feel fed. Um, nourishment isn't just physical, it's emotional, mental, and spiritual. And I think Jovita was absolutely on par with that. It is everything that we are connected to in the reciprocity with the natural world that um, really ties into food sovereignty. And Michelle, over to you. I feel like I try to come prepared for this, so I have a list. <laughs> it's a, a I think idea. it's an ongoing list. It's an ongoing process in my in my perspective um, in terms of defining um, food sovereignty. And the first thing I think about is that I believe that, and I think we even as an organization believe that it's context specific. Um, and while you know grounded in very specific values, I think our context and our communities that we're living within, we're working within, um, it's it's gonna shift a little bit in terms of, of what we focus on. Um, but at, at the core, I think it's, you know, right to culturally significant and healthy foods that are produced um, through the, the nurturing of our ecosystem and meaning humans, non-humans, um, soil, water resources as a, as a primary priority. And that's something that's obviously, we all know very missing from the dominant system um, that goes against food sovereignty that we're really, again, resisting and, and addressing. Um, I believe it centers our ecosystems as a whole, as well as cultural and historic um, histories and practices. And then something that we really focus on in our work at La Simia is, is really getting at um, both nurturing and fostering and, and being in relationship with others who are working towards food sovereignty, both regionally as well as nationally is equi an equitable and sustainable in the way that those who are actually growing the food that are tending the land should, um, and, and they're also, I think, caring and transmitting culture and, and knowledge and practice in relationship to food and agriculture and farming need to be at, need to be central to the decision-making processes. And this is something historically that you know, BIPOC, BIPOC communities have been excluded from these decision-making um, processes. And that's something we focus on as well and being very central to food sovereignty. So our communities as BIPOC communities, having a seat at the table and having access to resources and, and funding, but I would even add um, having stewardship of resources and funding. And that's something that is very missing from our food system as well as our funding system. And that's a lot of the work that we do within La Semilla as well, especially with regard to policy. Um, and, and then, yeah, I think, you know, a food sovereignty for myself and, and for the folks that I work with is a system within which our stories, our lived experiences and our histories matter and can be shared and heard. And again, I think this is an ongoing process and that, you know, shape differently as we continue to move through <laughs> this, this this fight, I think, for food sovereignty. Um, thank you. Uh, I love all of the different, because it's such a, it's like almost a big umbrella term. So I really appreciate all the different um, approaches to defining food sovereignty. Um, and okay, sorry, I'm going to move on to the next question, but also feel free to jump in if something just like strikes you and you want to like speak to that in that moment, go ahead, go for it. Um, so the next question is, what does it mean to actively decolonize or re-indigenize food ways? Because I think that's what's uh, like coming up a lot in these answers and with the food sovereignty movement as a whole. And I, how are folks in the, internalizing this call to decolonize or re-indigenize in the context of movements or the context of organizations and also as individuals? And if you feel like uh, you're ready to jump in, go ahead. So 
So I really, um, I am so glad to be seeing how many organizations and how many spaces, and I can only speak to, I know that, you know, both of you guys are working in multiple states, which I'm just so impressed by. Because <laughs> uh, I'm here in Albuquerque. And like I said, within the last 15 years has been the actual like push for food justice being a social justice issue, which, you know, on the one hand is, you know, kind of uh, hard to swallow. You know, it's such a new thing um, on like a, a forefront sort of space, you know, but at the same time, there have been people who've been working towards this in different states for years upon years. And there are people within New Mexico who've been working on it. It's just recently it's become a part of the um, main discussion that food justice is social justice, is a social, social justice issue. Um, I think, like I said earlier, it's incredible how many young people are starting to step back into their culture after years of oppression and years of losing you know, their languages, losing their ways of cooking, their ways of um, interacting with the natural world. And to watch this resurgence of uh, culturally relevant food justice um, thought processes has been really encouraging for me. And, you know, like on a personal and individual level, it's been encouraging for me to like start learning how to cook my traditional food, start to learn how to um, teach my traditional foods if I can, you know, even to my own kids, you know, I have five of them. So it's like, how can we start, how can we start thinking not only about our ancestors and the things that they brought to the table, literally, but also how can we start to be good ancestors ourselves? How can we push ourselves forward and realize that the things that we're building now and the community that we're building now and the movement that we're building now, it's going to directly affect several generations forward. And I think coming at it from this like um, longstanding mentality of, you know, past, present, future is going to benefit us so much as, you know, our communities grow and develop back into their, you know, honestly, cultural importance. So my two cents. <laughs> yes, I love that. Um... Like, uh, when I, I think about this question, um, I think about, like, first, like, acknowledging our history, like you said, like, past, present, future, like, um, some foods are indigenous to the desert and, you know, by the river that we've been growing for centuries, like corn and amaranth, and, you know, some foods were um, foods that came here through colonization, so, like, thinking about the time before the Pueblo Revolt and Spanish colonization, like, um, we were forced to grow foods for the Spanish. Like they forced us to grow certain foods that weren't from here, like melon and peaches. And it really makes you think about what foods like are indigenous to the, this area and our peoples. And like also like passing on those stories of like hardship and struggle. So we remember and honor our peoples that came before us, but also passing on planting knowledge from time immemorial. Like, um, like part of indigenizing our food ways is continuing to practice our cultural traditions like around our these food systems. So that means like playing Puna Bay on our fields in the spring, like singing our planting songs when we plant, and our ditch work songs when we clean our, the ditches, like reclaiming our indigenous seeds that have been taken far from our communities and rematriating them, like growing our indigenous seeds that have been climatized to our regions and our weather and like knowing how to dry and store them. Like we learn this through connection with community, like teaching each other, passing those traditions on to youth, um, you know, and like I love the youth work that you all are doing too. Um, it's a big part of who I am and what I do. And like um, teaching them, like, and, like continuing those traditions of like seed exchanges with each other, like creating seed libraries for our communities, so our community members have access to grow their own food. Like that's huge for food sovereignty is like just creating that access like sharing that knowledge, like um, during COVID, like so many people started gardening and farming, like it's been beautiful. <laughs> and we've also been like learning and sharing knowledge with each other, like so many community gardens and like planting programs exist now. 
And a lot of people are starting seed libraries and getting involved. It's really awesome. <laughs> like I got into gardening about seven years ago and like more so during the pandemic. And like I, I started like um, in the pandemic when I was like doing mutual aid work with uh, native organizers in Albuquerque, we started this community garden and we do these community feeds every Sunday for unsheltered folks. And we used to dream of starting a seed library. And so, um, you know, and, and when, and when COVID-19 materialized in New Mexico, like um, people like were scrambling to find ways to support other people who are stressed, couldn't find food there for their families. Um, they had to stay at home. Like uh, Michelle, you mentioned um, like that term food desert. Um, but one thing like one of my homies, like Aaron Loudon taught me was um, instead of calling it a food desert to start calling it a food apartheid because like a food desert implies that it's like natural, and, like it's just like a natural occurrence versus like uh, recognizing that like these situations were created by like, like st structures and imbalances of power. Um, so like thinking about food security and like food insecurity that was happening at the beginning of the pandemic, like, um, it was huge, like helping, like we, we started like helping people get their gardens ready to plant. Like we pulled weeds, we tilled ground, we began composting, like doing seed exchanges, building garden boxes. Like we trained in like other people on planting. So everybody's like gardens would be more successful. And I learned so much from like community, like from this wealth of knowledge that exists. And like, for those of us who are boots in the ground in indigenous communities, we know like, we can't wait around for colonizers to save our people who've been like historically overlooked. Like we have to save ourselves and like planting our own food is the answer. Like, um, that's why when uh, I, I was working for the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women, when I start, uh, first uh, created a relationship with Three Sisters Kitchen, um, we really started talking about violence prevention and, um, how there's heightened food insecurity and that that really fueled me and helped me to write this like food sovereignty grant um, to make that happen and to start an indigenous seed library like um, they helped me like build garden boxes and do these garden giveaways in tribal communities like we got funded and essentially I got to make my dream come true and like through that process like I met so many people that taught and helped me and that's why it was a success it wasn't about me it was about the people like I had a huge support system around me and like that's a huge part of you know decolonizing our food ways and like is like you know realizing the power is with each other um like Aaron Loudon who I just mentioned um he was huge like he did these foundational workshop for us that like helped us really get the seed library off the ground um, and really taught us about indigenous food ways and indigenous seed saving and all of these uh, really important um, things that we needed to know to, to do this work. Um, and he actually gave us our first like large seed donation uh, for our seed library and helped us get into contact with other people that could um, hook us up with like our indigenous seeds. And then uh, we partnered with Fuse Makerspace at CNM to build all the garden boxes. Like we showed them a plan of the garden boxes that our friends at Food History Albuquerque were, were uh, making. And we showed them one of the boxes and they like reverse engineered it. And they're like, hey, we have a like an easier way for you to do this. And so they like helped us um, make it all happen. And then Soil Lucians, um, we partnered with them. They're a local soil place here in Albuquerque and they donated all the soil for our garden giveaways because they just like believed in helping people grow their own food. Um, and then like Food is Free Albuquerque, like they were huge. Like they're just an organization of folks that, that think that food should be free because it should. And like they had already been doing these garden giveaway events for a year. Um, when we reached out to them and we're like, hey, we have this like idea, but we heard you've been doing it. And they're like, yeah, like, let's do it together. And they, and it, they really helped us. Like they connected us with folks. They helped make them all happen. They volunteered with us and um, they made them bigger, better and uh, more awesome. So like thinking about like food sovereignty, thinking about like um, decolonization, thinking about like re-indigenizing our food ways, really like the way we do that is with community. Um, 
I think that's like, you know, our people, that's how we make it all happen. So. Um, I guess I could, I could follow. I, I just want to say, as I'm listening, both of you, like Javita and, and Rebecca, I'm just really grateful, honestly, to be on this panel <laughs> and to hear your perspectives, but also all the work that you're doing. Um, it's just really invigorating and really, I just, I feel really blessed and honored to be on this panel. Um, but I, I just, I want to add a, a few things too, because I think there's a lot going on and I can't help but think about the work that we're doing at La Semilla too, down, down here in Southern New Mexico. Um, in terms of internalizing, I really sat with that question for a, a while because I kind of felt that in terms of other individuals, I can't speak for how people are internalizing this. Um, I can only kind of speak for myself. And, and then of course, on an organizational level, in terms of how our work relates to, to decolonizing the food systems. And at an individual level, I just think really what's so central is just all the unlearning that we're always having to do. You know, the systems that we're born into, um, it takes a lot of work and a lot of intentionality, I think, to unlearn and to really fully come to terms with the fact that this is not natural and this is not the way things were supposed to be, which sounds again romantic, but I'm always hesitant to be too romantic. I don't know if that's my sociology background, <laughs> but um, I think unlearning is really essential in that way. And in thinking about both individual and organizational factors within La Semilla, we're an organization that is primarily led by, by women and femmes and, and non-binary folks, um, largely from you know, Latinx community, but also mixed race. And you know, in speaking with, with our leadership over you know, the time I worked with La Semilla, I mean, a lot of us really grew up in you know, being told in some form that not to speak up, not to take up space. And I think that's, I know that's affected me personally as an adult now of being really hesitant, being self-depreciating all the time, which I think is just me being awkward and also how I deal with things and humor. But um, I think that is is a big part of like that individual internal, internalization and really pushing back against that and kind of, you know, taking up space and, and doing the work that we're doing. and. You know, a lot of my coworkers in in the rooms, even if you know virtual rooms that they're in, you know, a lot of that is is very much there, and those hierarchies are there. That if you're you know a woman or a femme or non-binary and of color, person of color, you get kind of rendered you know in a specific way, or you're you know, like I said, it's, sometimes it's subtle to not speak up, and there's a lot more to that I won't get into because I think maybe we've all experienced that. But in terms of an organization. Uh, La Semilla and how I think we are actively decolonizing um, in, in definitely many of the ways I think we can relate to the work y'all are doing, um, but also, you know, internally as an organization. So, you know, I know our, our executive director has talked about, you know, our values really need to be evident in our practice and how we operate as an organization even internally in terms of how we're compensating our staff, how we're compensating um, the, the community members and, and folks that we you know, do contract work with and are collaborating with. So being really intentionally as, an organ as a nonprofit organization working within the food system and working within foodways, we're very intentional and I think it's a process, right? It's not something you like always fix right away and it's always ongoing that we're not perpetuating those colonial hierarchies in our work as well. And I think it kind of gets to that old, you know, term of, you know, what is it you have, not just, what is it talking the talk and walking the walk? Is that even the, I don't even know if that's a phrase. So correct me if I'm wrong, but practicing what we preach. And yeah, I think um, there's so many levels to that, but I think it's important um, in the work that we do that we always look inward as well and internally and that we're not perpetuating these hierarchies that we're proposing to speak against, if that makes sense. So I think there's a lot of work that La Semilla is doing and as, as a staff member who came on a little bit over a year ago, um, even though I've been following La Semilla for many years, that honestly in a really good way kind of blew my mind and it's been a process to go from working um, in a system with city government that's so different 
from what I'm experiencing at La Semilla in terms of my mental health being prioritized, which I've never experienced in a job in my life. <laughs> so um, I think it's all it's all connected again to the work that we're doing in community and in collaboration in the region. But I just wanted to kind of add that other level that I think we as an organization that we're trying to do in terms of decolonization. Michelle, can I just say um, something that really hit me is I like that you romanticize because, you know, in so many situations, what we have is this, like, um, we romanticize this idea that, you know, the, <laughs> the flavorless chicken and the flavorless, you know, uh, broccoli meal prep is, like, the way, the healthy way to be. And I think that until we start, like, romanticizing our own food systems and romanticizing our own sense of, like, cultural identity that it's going to be hard for people to like have that permission, you know? And so I think 150%, you should just keep doing that. <laughs> like, Just yeah. keep romanticizing it. Just keep pushing that because man, it is so beautiful to hear. <laughs> like, oh, no, thanks for that. Cause you made me thinking about like, when I think about romanticizing, I think of I'm being overly positive, you know? And I think romanticizing maybe is also those complexities. You know, I think um, it's it's easy to sometimes romanticize, for example, like the desert and our native plants, but nature can be really vicious <laughs> too. Yeah. And I'm I'm laughing because I, I got poked by an agave plant a few weeks ago and it was like a very big wake-up call of like this is nature and this is, you know, <laughs> it's all part of it and it's all beautiful. It just really stings <laughs> in the moment, but also, you know, really I don't want to say forced me, but made me think about like respecting boundaries <laughs> with, yeah. with the plants but I think yeah I, I appreciate you bringing that up because um yeah maybe the romanticizing isn't the overly positive it's part of the the beauty and, and the reality of these complexities which is that much more better than stagnant <laughs> things we're talking about so thank you yeah and like just to add on that I think it's just like human and it like gives you room to dream and fail and like and like I don't know I feel like like this western like idea of like growing food and gardening is like super sterile and it's like this goes here and this goes here when really it's all like everything is together like your feelings and your love should be going into those plants like your prayers and your love that goes into it like that goes into the food and just like I, I was telling my partner the other day I was like you know it's not just like the love and prayers that you you know say for your seeds or when you're planting or when you're you know when you're talking to them but it's also like when you're preparing them you know like when you're like upset and you're like angrily cutting something it's like please stop cooking <laughs> like I don't want to get sick <laughs> You know, like, and just like allowing that love to just be in flow and like have relationship, I feel like is decolonizing, you know, like do that, be that. <laughs> hey, if you want to be positive, you do it. <laughs> well, yeah, and I feel like, you know, a lot of it is kind of like we have this fear around. Um, I think that there's a big issue with like spiritual bypassing and stuff like that, because sometimes things are hard and they hurt. And it's just like, you know was said earlier like we have these wounds that need to be um cleaned out and dealt with and wrapped and taken care of and but with that is like this immense beauty in this restructuring this rehealing that we're trying to do and absolutely like I think that the romanticizing of this like sort of work and the like the push that the dreaming like you said Jovita like the dreaming is so important because um, what do we have if we don't have this dream to work towards, you know, if we don't have this, like, knowledge and this push to, like, build that out and build a future for ourselves, build a future for our grandkids, like, what more is there than, you know, to dream on? Um, well, I, I plan to be that crazy plant lady. <laughs> My sister's always sharing those memes of people like being like, oh, I went, I went grocery shopping the other day and they like come home with 50 plants <laughs> and that's who I want to be. <laughs> I love this aspiration. <laughs> um, 
I was going to say in the spirit of dreaming and being romantic, um, my question, I figured we could skip a little bit ahead and sort of do some imagining of the future that you hope to see. Um, and maybe we could start there if you'd like to speak to like what it might take to get us there. That would be great, but also happy to spend some time just just imagining and putting it out there. Um, and whoever wants to jump in. I mean, I can try. It's like it got kind of quiet and um, I'll make a fool of myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, I i guess this is yeah kind of like the, the future we hope to see and and kind of what we think is is maybe necessary to get there um i feel like all of this is complex and y'all gonna hate me because every time <laughs> the complexities are there um i think i kind of want to start with maybe how do we get there because i i want to hope and dream but i'm I tend to be cynical, maybe or a little bit more focused on the work, but I think again, it's 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 such an ongoing process, and I think it's learning how we go and learning together. And and I think Javita's mentioned multiple times, like the relationship aspect, you know, the relational, and that's so key. And I really appreciate. I think you know, you're talking about the work you, that you do, and that it just wouldn't have been possible without everybody involved, without the community involved. And I really firmly believe that. Um, and I think something that's difficult for me to think about is really the hard, hard dialogue that's needed in this work. Um, and I, I feel like I'm always saying, even just to myself, <laughs> talking to myself, is dialogue's really difficult. Like there's conversation and there's dialogue. And dialogue involves sometimes meeting others at a place in the middle that we're not always going to agree on the approaches or even how we're really seeing the issues that we're, we're facing. And I think. It, it goes beyond um, just preaching to the choir. And I think that can be really difficult in terms of being intentional, of course, of who we collaborate with, but how do we reach and communicate and learn from people who don't agree with us in the circumstances that we're living in? And I, I do believe that there's there's compromises to be made and then there's not compromises to be made. Like it's, it's you're not gonna be able to relate and work with everybody. And I think we all know that, but I think that hard, hard, committing to that hard dialogue is, is really crucial and is an ongoing process too. And um, I really appreciate it because I thought about this as well um, in terms of Rebecca, what you said really early on about mental health and in thinking about how we get there, um, and I'm, I'll be really curious to hear your all's perspectives as well. I, I couldn't help but think about how we get there also necessitates um, intentionally considering and, and listening to um, our mental health and our physical health. I think, you know, like we're, we're humans, we're, we're bodies. And, you know, I know that this work can be very tiring and can be very taxing. And there's way too many stories of of you know folks organizers and activists many of whom we will never know their names who have lost their lives to the work from whether mental health stress um, other factors that take a toll on the body so i think acknowledging that aspect and again i don't think we live in in a system that fully gives mental health enough attention i think there's a lot of great work out there but i just think that's missing a lot um, and then I think within that is, you know, acknowledging that toll that it takes and the grief that it creates. Um, and for, you know, how I'm learning within La Semilla and the people that I'm working with and learning from every week is really reconnecting to land-based practices. I think we've touched on that quite a bit and learning from them. So, you know, remembering um, our bodies and how we connect to the land and really taking in our five senses and how much we can learn from those connections. Like um, a really great example is earlier this year when we had our first frost, um, our executive director, uh, Christina um, Dominguez, really emphasized or encouraged us to not just like see the first frost and what it was doing to our plants, but to really live in that space and experience how our farm felt in that moment and really listen to our senses. And I still struggle a lot with that. I think I'm still learning to, 
to be calm and to really listen in that way. But I do think that all of this is is also very necessary in how we get to where we want to go. Um, and I guess the future I hope to see would be, you know, a future that we we acknowledge that as as a whole and that we connect with each other um, and and make space for that uh, amongst like the other hopes and dreams I think I have for the future. And I think um, I can't help but consider all the many roles that we play in building this hope and and just listening to voices that we don't always listen to, you know, um, in terms of even, you know, disability, neurodiversity is really, really near and dear to my heart and my experience. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's complex, but I think it's, it's very much worth fighting for and, and getting there, so. I would, I would like to say, you know, something that really, um, in regards to mental health, which I think is a really big thing that we have to start acknowledging within these activism spaces. Um, I was told recently by a very near and dear friend of mine that there is a difference between the mentality of laziness and rest. And so something internally that I've been working with and trying to like really push is like, I'm not lazy. I'm resting, you know, because we are, we're pushing so hard in these spaces and we're, we're stressing ourselves out, like we're stressing our bodies out. But um, that in itself is also like this colonizer mindset of like grind, make it work, make it happen. Like, you know, at its root, like rest is resistance, like being able to rest and being able to like take the time for your mental health, being able to take care of yourself when you're sick, being able to feed yourself when you're hungry is resistance in itself because this is a system that doesn't allow us that space um so yeah absolutely I love I love all of that um as far as the future I would like to see I mean I'm so tied into the the ecological aspect of it right now um building this like platform for us to have youth programs building this space uh, we took this whole last winter off from growing we didn't do any cover crop or anything like that to rebuild our irrigation system, to rebuild our farming system, to rebuild our distribution system. Because what we were finding was in this push for um, activism and in this push for like big ideas and big dreams, we were also neglecting the groundwork that needed to happen. The difficult conversations around what is sustainable food systems, like difficult conversations around how do we build sustainable food systems in areas where it's not necessarily like ecologically secure. We're right here in the middle of a huge um, like urban sprawl and right next to a golf course that's using massive amounts of water, right? And so the discussion around it is really like, how do we... Ooh, Sorry about that. There's some stuff happening here. Um, how do we begin to build our future um, without like doing the dirty work? And Michelle, I think you're you're on part of that, doing the hard work, doing the like dig your boots into the earth, dig your fingers into the ground, and have those conversations that hurt and those conversations that are difficult. Because if we don't have this groundwork and if we don't have this stable space to work from um, anything we build up is going to be innately unstable and unable to sustain itself you know and I keep on going back to this because it's important to me because like I said I have kids I want to build something that's stable enough that they can carry it on I want to build something that is that is deep enough and rooted enough that they can then grow it you know so my I mean like my ideal future is that we have this multicultural respective reci reciprocal relationship with each other with everybody doing this work and we start to build systems that innately support communities um and definitely in every single field i mean like i said food justice is social justice and our mental emotional cultural and spiritual um health is directly tied into that Yeah, um, absolutely. I love what both of you are saying. <laughs> uh, 
I, I also have like all this gratitude for just being in this space. So thank you um, for all of your words. Um, yeah, I, I, all of those things, a million times, all of those things, um, you know, I, you know, a feature I hope to see is one where our people are healthy and thriving. Um, our planting and seed work is carried on by our youth and our foodways are sustainable because that's the only way we get there. Um, we've like rematriated our seed relatives and are growing our indigenous foods like on a level that we can feed our people and our people aren't hungry and our people have fewer health problems that are happy. Um, but the way that we get there. <laughs> so I feel like it always comes back to this because it has to, <laughs> but it's to tear down capitalism and create systems that are built by and accountable to our people. I'm sorry, it always comes back to tearing down capitalism. I just want to yell yes at that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> like we have to create systems where our people aren't pushed further into poverty by hunger and greed like we have to come together and realize the revolution we desperately need and like um i don't know just like valuing ourselves like like um michelle like you were talking about like valuing mental and emotional health and like our system now like actively devalues those things like we need to remake them like we need to build our communities in a way like where we like intentionally are building and protecting our mental and emotional health, like in our well being. Like, like I don't want to treat symptoms of harm. I want to prevent them because I'm a preventionist and like that's how I think. But also, like um, I'm a big commie, so there's that. <laughs> but like Rebecca, you're saying like um, like we got to make time for like uh, rest and self care. And like, that's essential. Like we should be doing that. Like all of us should be doing it and we should be making like room to ensure that like everyone in our community is doing that. And that is the norm because like, that's how we change it is we make it our reality, I guess. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm starting off with. I've been very close to shedding a tear multiple times throughout this. And if it comes, it comes, that's fine. But um, I super appreciate this conversation. On the one hand, I, I love, you know, uh, like, yes, tear down capitalism. And I also think like speaking to all of your points, the way that capitalism and the more sterile dominant approach to farming has really removed the worker from the food and Michelle, your point about the way that BIPOC land workers are like denied stewardship and like, and this idea of like basically the worlds that I might be, I don't want to like speak for you all, but I feel like there's just, it's just a far more integrated ecosystem. The way that food is grown in a really specific ecosystem that requires it, it needs change. It's not like it's a static thing. Like every year it might change and you need to put nutrients back in the soil so that, and like that being a microcosm, or maybe it's the other way around, that the, the movement is the microcosm for, um, for how food works and how it nourishes us. Um, yeah, it's just like the interrelation, the relationship building I think is also really an important and key, um, key thought of this. Um, I thought one last question that just popped into my head would be, I would love to know, it's a kind of a personal question. If there was like a food memory, it could be a dish or it could be an ingredient or it could be working in the garden. If there's like a memory that you have or just a moment where you felt just really connected to your culture, your identity, your work, um, just like a, yeah, a moment with food. Um, yeah. And you can take a second to think on that. But. I can tell you right now because it just happened this last year. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I keep on, like, jumping in quick. No um, apologies. <laughs> so I, I have a really deep bond with calitas, right? They were one of the, one of the foods that my mom carried in, um, even in her internalized colonization that she like has been, you know, fighting through for the last, you know, something years I'm not until your age anyways um she would have us go outside and harvest calitas and 
we would bring it in and we'd make beans and quelites and tortillas. And it was just like, it was this moment of like connection in like a family that, that had a hard time being connected, um, both to like our ancestors and to each other. And this last year, I was out here at Project Feed the Hood and we had like a bunch of quelites in this one area. And um, when they dried out, I picked them and I went through the entire garden and I shook out the seeds all over the garden and this year all of the spots that have been shaken out all the spots that I walked there are kitties that's coming out and so for me it was like this moment of like there it is like there's the tie there's the space you know and um yeah just walking just walking the land just like being able to steward this land being able to like teach people the knowledge that I have and learn from, I can't tell you the amount of times I've learned from my youth at this point. They are so intelligent. They draw conclusions. They draw like um, comparisons that you just cannot even begin to like get to, you know, maybe it's just like I'm aging out of that, you know, flexibility in my brain, (laughs) but it's amazing to watch how youth and how people are able to interact with the earth and interact in reciprocity with communities and each other. And it just made me feel like, wow, okay, here we go. You know, like we're doing it. We're doing something right. (laughs) I love that. That's beautiful. (laughs) Mine is kind of like an opposite story. (laughs) And like, um, I was uh, like working in the garden with um, some friends who have been gardening for a lot longer than I have. And I was just like being really like down on myself because <laughs> I was like talking about like all the mistakes I made and like how my garden was just like got messed up in all these different ways. And I was just like, oh, like I try so hard <laughs> to like put my heart in it. And then one of my aunties was like, come here, my girl, let me talk to you. And I said, you know, just because you've been having these issues, like, doesn't mean you're not a good farmer, you're not a good gardener. And they said, you know, like, part of doing this is like learning from all of those mistakes. And, you know, you know, I've been gardening my whole life. And, you know, I still, you know, learn stuff every year, I'll still make a mistake and, you know, figure it out. And, so like for me it was like kind of it it made me feel connected it made me feel like okay like I am on the right path because like I was trying to learn all these things and do all these things and like you know I I was like really discouraged you know I felt like I had like moved faster than I was supposed to be moving and you know they're like no you're exactly where you need to be and I was like okay you know, it's okay to like do this and like fail a lot of times, like just keep doing it because it's important. It's what we do. So, yeah. I feel like I really needed to hear that right now because my window, my office window, I, this is my first time doing raised beds and I'm just like chomping at the bit all the time. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Am I failing? I'm just trying to keep everybody alive at this point. Um, so I appreciated hearing that a lot from you, um, Jovita. Um, if it's okay, can I share two memories? Like one of them is really, really short because I kind of was trying to go with what immediately came to mind when you asked that question. And I think both of these memories I wanted to share are both related to like connection and, and trying to reconnect with for myself and in terms of my family and our relationship to farming and, and to the land. And my first thought was actually a dream that I had many years ago of my great grandma um, who passed away when I was only four years old and she had Alzheimer's. So I, I didn't really know her the way like my, my mom knew her and grew up with her as her grandma, um, which her, the stories about her are incredible and very, I would say inspiring in a lot of ways, just the strength of my great grandmother and everything she went through in her life. She definitely wasn't perfect. I've heard some horror stories about about her too and things that she did were not like that bad. I don't want to give the assumption that she was like this horrible person, but just very realistic, multidimensional woman. But I I had a dream 
many years ago when I was just starting my, my research for my dissertation, which focused on solidarity economy and ur urban agriculture and that sort of thing. And I had a dream about her canning um, vegetables and fruit. And I had always heard stories of her, of how she was like this Renaissance woman who had a garden and she had chickens and had this strong connection to agriculture. And so that's what came to mind immediately is how even in a subconscious way, I, for the first time was really connecting with her through a dream. And then I thought about a more recent memory that has sat with me a lot and very nicely heavy, not in a bad way heavy. Um, a couple of months ago, my mom who actually lives in Albuquerque um, came down to visit and we visited the La Semilla farm, community farm. And that was her first time there. And she was learning about the work I'm doing and about our organization. And just walking around the farm, she, I could tell was very moved and the different crops she was seeing, the fruit trees were bringing back all these memories for my mom of growing up and visiting our family in Mexico and the ranches and the farms. And she would describe like the way the food tastes, the fruit tasted and the times they would spend like, you know, playing as little kids. And it was such a visible and very special moment for me to see how just being in that space brought back so much for my mom and not only in seeing what her kid was doing and you know understanding a little bit more about the work that I'm a part of but just personally in her own kind of connections so that that was just really special to me and I think represents a lot but also made me feel very close to my mom in that moment. Wow, thank you all. Thanks also for sharing those memories and food stories. That was a really, I really appreciate that. Um, but yes, um, thank you so much for taking part in this panel. I feel extremely inspired both to tackle the garden bed in my backyard and also about the future of food sovereignty. Um, yeah, I think I'll pass it back to Bethany, but thank you so much again to the three of you. This was an amazing panel. I really, really appreciated how your three approaches and ideas really just worked together in sync. It was a nice ecosystem. So I appreciate it. Nice use of the word ecosystem, Isha. <laughs> thank you. Potassium. Uh, I forgot the other two. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much. Um, this was a yeah, just really stunning conversation. The way that all of your perspectives wove into one another. Um, I especially liked how all of you, um, the way that you speak about food and and the ecosystem and and um, nature around us, you speak as though they are as though they are kin, as though they are they people and family. And I just think that um, if everybody could internalize that thinking about ingredients and thinking about food as, as relatives, um, it's that alone does so much for our relationship to food, um, repairing that relationship, uh, culturally. So I just, uh, appreciate your time and generosity so much, um, for being here today and sharing all of your thoughts. Um, and thank you, especially also to Isha and Divana at the Three Sisters Kitchen. Uh, New Mexico Humanities Council is lucky to have you guys as partners. Um, and yeah, information about all of uh, your organizations will be linked below in the description of this YouTube video. So uh, you can find out more um, about all of the great work that Michelle, Rebecca, and Jovita do. So with that, uh, signing off, thanks. <laughs>